you very much. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to, to be here, Paul. Um, you've meant a lot. Um, more than just as a scientist and a colleague, Paul and I crossed paths uh, during the time, whoops, I'm too far, that um, we were in Boulder. I didn't realize I was in Boulder about three and a half years. Paul came about six months before I came, and he left about six months after I left to come here to Max Planck. So it, wasn't more, it was more than just a scientific collaboration. Um, I don't know if two or two you remember this, but this was the present you gave my son David in the hospital. Um, both of our sons were born in Boulder. Paul and Tertu, in both instances, were the first ones to see our sons in the hospital. So it was more than just, like I say, scientific collaboration, very personal collaboration. Ilona was our first babysitter. Sylvia was our last babysitter before we left Boulder. So um, that's a little bit of the history of, of the relationship between the Fishmans and the Crutzens. Um, my life is much better for it. But the first, Paul was my dissertation advisor, but the first project we worked on, Paul, if you remember, was to calculate the distribution of OH in the troposphere. To do that, we needed to look at the concentrations of uh, ozone, water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, but you were most interested in what happens because of the new kinetic information that's coming out of the, the Aronimo lab, in particular, uh, Carlton Howard's HO2 plus NO reaction. So Paul came up with the idea, let's calculate a, a global distribution of OH. There had been a lot of research going on about OH and methane oxidation. And to do that, we put all these parameters into the model, and we came up with a number of 2.5 times 10 to the fifth, which was about an order of magnitude less than what had been calculated before. So this was sort of revolutionary. At the time, Paul said, this is a really important paper. And I said, okay, I didn't really understand the significance. But we go into it a little more detail, and we expanded the calculations to include the southern hemisphere, but there were no southern hemispheric data. Well, there's this young lady coming through Boulder from away from Chicago to Berkeley, and we put her to work for a summer, and um, I just remember Susan going through these famous red books, which is where the ozone data were, were contained. So she came up with the distribution in the southern hemisphere. We put the two together, so we ended up with the first global distribution of tropospheric ozone to do the first global calculation of tropospheric ozone. Out of that came, came two papers, and of significance of that first paper, which was a sort of a quick and dirty paper, which looked at the amount of ozone destruction at the ground in the two hemispheres, and it became pretty obvious that there's much more land in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So if your deposition rate is primarily over land, about 10 times more efficient than over ocean, if you've got the fluxes coming in from both hemispheres that are the same through the stratus, from the stratosphere of the troposphere, you should have much less ozone then in the northern hemisphere. But because of Susan's analysis and, and our calculations, we're actually having more ozone in the northern hemisphere. So the one statement that Paul definitely contributed to in, that in, in this first paper was the suggestion that, indeed, tropospheric ozone is increasing. And it's increasing because of industrialized emissions. And I think this may be the first indication of, of what he meant by the Anthropocene in this paper that was published in 1978. So this was, was a simple result of the model we came up with. Basically, and this is the old picture of tropospheric ozone. It's all produced in the stratosphere. It all comes uh, down through the tropopause folds. It's destroyed at the surface. There was no chemistry that took place, but then a bunch of reactions started to occur because of the OH radical. And the theory at that time was that, indeed, there is photochemistry that's important, but it was believed it was only methane photochemistry to, to make ozone, which would make the production in both hemispheres basically equal. However, the conclusion is, since, since there's more ozone in the northern hemisphere, and because there's more CO present in the northern hemisphere, this is based on the paper that was published by Wolfgang Zeiler in 1974, and we inferred that there was a relationship probably between NO and CO. Therefore, there must be considerable more ozone produced in the northern hemisphere. Well, the other aspect of these calculations is the fact that 
we could not make the CO budget balance, okay? So there had to be additional sources of carbon monoxide. And, and Wolfgang Zeiler at the time was the expert in, in carbon monoxide. He invited, Paul invited him to come to NCAR. Uh, and as a result, um, we sort of set up this collaboration, a tale of two cities, a tale of two molecules. Wolfgang and Paul worked very hard to produce this, this really important paper that was published in 1980 that sort of pointed to the first time of how important biomass burning was, and that could indeed be the source of uh, large amounts of carbon dioxide to help balance the budget. To validate what he was trying to do, Paul organized these expeditions down to Brazil in 1979 and 1980. Now, I, I had not seen these data before, and um, in 1984, NASA was, was planning its first meal, field mission as part of the Global Tropospheric Experiment, and they're going to fly around Brazil. Tony Delaney was invited to talk about some of the findings in Brazil, and Tony presented this profile, which shows much higher ozone concentrations throughout the troposphere than the values that Susan had sort of come up with, that Wolfgang had also seen, the, 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 the uh, dash line there. So in other words, there is a big enhancement during biomass burning uh, events in, in Brazil anyway. If you do the calculations, this was literally a back of the envelope calculation during this presentation. I estimated that you could integrate this ozone in the troposphere and you measure integrated amount of ozone in, in something called Dobson units. And if you look at the difference between these profiles and what was published in the literature, there is an enhancement on the order of about 20 DOPS units. Okay, now at the same time, NASA was flying an instrument. It just happened to turn out that the principal investigator was Arlen Kruger. It also happened to be that Arlen was Paul's second student to start. But because of Tom's, he was not the second to finish. Um, I think Susan, you had that honor. And um, I called Arlen and asked, could we see this enhancement in the TOMS data? Of course, TOMS was of big interest at that time because of the recent discovery of the ozone hole. It was, it was designed to measure stratospheric ozone. Arlen said, yes, I think we can. It has a precision of 1% to 3%. If we see a 10 to 20 adoption in unit enhancement because of biomass burning, we should see it. So Arlen sent me the, the data, and indeed, uh, we were able to look at these enhancements one day to the next, and this is Brazil. You see a little bit of ozone there, but you see these enhancements on the 12th and the 13th, okay, and it sort of disappear on the 14th. Um, it turns out that another colleague of mine, uh, Pat Minnis, was, was an expert in biomass burning. We could, we could actually see the fires in Brazil that coincided with these hot spots of, of ozone as well. So we did publish a paper that talked about seeing satellite uh, images of, or satellite enhancements in the TOMS data uh, related to the biomass burning in the tropics. Well, one of the reasons I went to NASA lately was that they had an instrument in space that was going to be on the space shuttle called the MAPS instrument, measuring of air pollution from satellites. And it had flown a couple times already. And basically what we did in this paper with um, myself and, and Pat Minnis and Hank Richley was to look at the carbon monoxide distribution that had been measured during these flights. This is a 1984 flight, but they also saw this in 1981. And what you see are these large concentrations of carbon monoxide in the tropics during the October time frame. If we look at the TOMS total ozone, now this is total ozone, 90% of the ozone is roughly in the stratosphere, but you could still see that there was some kind of anomaly here at the low latitudes that seemed to be present. And if you just did a fairly simple calculation, you could see that the TOMS total ozone data and the MAPS carbon monoxide data were highly correlated in the tropics. Not correlated at the higher latitudes, this being the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, but this high correlation in the, in the southern hemisphere, in the tropical regions of the atmosphere, which certainly implied that if we're seeing ozone down there, it can't be coming from the stratosphere. It's, it's, it's got to be correlated with the CO. Well, so we sort of expanded the picture to sort of like three cities, to Mainz and Boulder and, and Hampton, Virginia. 
those were total ozone measurements. Now somehow we had to find a way of separating the, the troposphere from the stratosphere, um, or the, the troposphere from the total column, because we had the total column measurements. It so happened that there was another measurement capability, the SAGE instrument, which the flying was an instrument out of NASA Langley uh, by Pat McCormick. And we could actually end up with ozone profiles in the stratosphere. So looking at the SAGE data, and later on we ended up using SBUV data, which is another American satellite that could give you stratospheric information, we basically took the total column, which is about 300 DOPS units, we integrated the stratospheric component, which is about 270, and we end up with what was called the tropospheric residual. And even though the measurement of each of these quantities is, is, is uh, relatively small, the difference is small, the really nice thing about satellites is they make tens of thousands of measurements. And because of that, you start to see patterns that evolve, okay, and this is a paper published in 2003 using the SBUV data, and indeed what you do see is the northern hemisphere pollution, that is what we see, what we call photochemical smog. But the more surprising feature was indeed this tropospheric enhancement during September, October, and November in the southern hemisphere. Probably the result of biomass burning, but we weren't 100% sure. This whole finding, which was published initially in 1988 at a, at a conference in um, uh, Norway, uh, where it was speculative, um, led to some exciting buzz in, in the atmospheric chemistry community. Andy, Andre, and I uh, got together and through the IGAC, um, whoops, wrong one. Through the IGAC project, we put together the South Trop Southern Tropical Atlantic Regional Experiment of which there were two major components. The Trace A component, which was headed by NASA and myself as the PI, and the Safari component, which was more interested in, in the local biomass burning. Safari stood for Southern African Fire Atmosphere Research Initiative, and on a scale of one to 10 for acronyms, it gets a 10, okay? Uh, Trace A was not as exciting. It, it was a tra transport and atmospheric near the equator dash Atlantic. Um, Again, a United Max Planck Institute with the GTE project headquartered in NASA Langley under the whole umbra scientific umbrella of, of IGAC. This was sort of the summary of the findings, and basically what we're seeing is burning that takes place in Africa, in this region here, and I'm going to concentrate on this flight path between, this is the DC-8 that the NASA was flying in, between uh, off the coast of uh, Africa as we, as we come across the African continent, you can see this is ocean, here's the land, okay? This is all the burning from biomass burning. This is a, a UV dial system. This is the um, aerosol component. And you see this big plume of, of pollution smoke coming into uh, the ocean with strong subsidence. At the same time, there's a pollution, and, and this is the high ozone associated with that plume of aerosols. There's another pollution plume that's coming across from, Af from South America. Basically, the emissions here are getting uh, convected into the middle troposphere. They get caught in the westerlies, and they come over here. So where these two plumes meet from the satellite, this is where you see the max amount of ozone. Okay, so that was um, an exciting discovery, and we had a, a, a big issue of um, JGR publish. Okay. So now if we look at the original hypothesis that if indeed uh, tropospheric ozone is being produced photochemically, there should be, should be an increase since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. There was a paper published in 1988 by Dieter Klein and, and by Andreas Vols Thomas, um, Andreas Vols at that time, um, that looked at some Montserrat data out of an observ observatory outside of Paris that went back to the 19, uh, 1880s. And this summary that was put together by uh, Marenko, you can definitely see this increase in tropospheric ozone between the 1880s and 1990. Here's another analysis that was done by uh, Johann uh, Strelein, uh, again showing measurements over Europe in the 1950s and 60s compared with measurements over Europe at different altitudes in the 90s. So you do see this increase. And then a more recent study that has been conducted by the NOAA group, uh, NOAA Aeronomy group, shows that this increase has continued even into the 2000s, okay? Uh, this paper was published in 2010. Their data set goes through um, 
2006. And so these are the three data sets sort of put on top of each other. So indeed, there is a large increase in tropospheric ozone. Um, as a result of our work, we had this, this large um, database of tropospheric ozone, a data back from 1979 through 2005. And one of the interesting studies that we could do was interannual variability of the tropospheric ozone uh, amounts. And what we, seemed to no whoops. what we seemed to notice was that, indeed, over northern India, the, the region that, uh, that Ron just talked about, you could see various amounts of ozone in June that were much higher in the El Nino years than in the uh, La Nina years. When I started to investigate this further, I said, well, who can help explain this photochemically? Gee whiz, it, it just turned out that Paul had just finished doing this Asian brown cloud study. So we, we published this paper in 2005, and, and it was fun to work with Paul after not working with him for the last uh, 15 to 20 years before that. So this became an important paper, and we, and we stretched this interannual inter 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 variability concept to looking at regions in the United States. And what we see is, is that this is three consecutive years. This is July. 1998, 1999, and, and 2000. And you do see this, this variability over this region, which happens to be a big uh, soybean belt region in the United States. Soybeans are a $40 billion a year industry. And research had shown that um, as the ozone enters the, the leaves, it actually destroys some of the leaves and the processes by which they can, the plants can reproduce. So there is a, a bunch of, you know, as the um, air enters, as, as the gases enter the bottom of the leaf through the stomata, this is how they get their CO2 to, to do photosynthesis. But if they're breathing in ozone, the ozone reacts with, with some of the uh, plant matter itself. It, it kills these cells, and eventually you can see some patterns on the top of the leaf that is unusual and unique to the formation of, of ozone. Um, and this is an example of, of a plant uh, exposed to ozone at higher, at higher concentrations. This happens to be in the Smoky Mountain National Parks. And one of the sensitive plants is the common milkweed. A healthy milkweed plant is green. You can see what happens when it's affected by large concentrations of ozone. Well, in the U.S., there are, there are some studies being done in the 1980s through the NCLAN, National Crop Loss Assessment Network, whereby they, they under control conditions, looked at where do uh, pro where does productivity within a plant start to decline? And you can see they did a number of different um, um, crops. And the, these crops here, and soybean is one of them, all around 40 parts per billion start to show some kind of decrease in yield. So the question is, can you see a decrease in yield that is related to the variations in ozone on a year-to-year -year basis? So this was the satellite data, and you can sort of see that whoops, in this particular uh, depiction, the ozone sort of runs from northwest to southeast with a higher gradient. And you can see the crop yield sort of has an inverse gradient. Okay? And these are the surface data where we had measurements of, of surface ozone. So we put all this into a model. There is an anti-correlation, but there are other factors that are important, and the most important factors are precipitation and temperature. Well, bottom line is if you look at the area surrounding this University of Illinois field site, okay, we come up with a decrease of, of uh, yield. It's, it basically is, is a linear curve that you, that you find. And this agreed fairly well with what the SOIFACE uh, University of Illinois study said. If we divided our study region into a northern, southern, northern, central, and southern region, indeed you see the higher concentrations in the south, we did get a statistically significant effect using the ozone data, the satellite data. We did not find an effect in the northern or central regions. So if we go back to the original curve of soybean yield as a function of concentration, and we look at where the concentration was in the 1900s, the 1950s, and in this study we just completed in the 2000s and looking at the three different regions, north, central, and south, this is what we find based on our Fishman study, okay? The laboratory study done at the University of Illinois falls along this. So it's consistent. It's, a, it's an interesting picture, and then we come back to our original question, okay? 
if indeed tropospheric ozone has increased as it has, okay, are we now creating a situation in which it is toxic, the atmosphere is toxic to certain plants? And the answer is yes, and, and, and you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a total obvious picture, but uh, one of the interesting anecdotes of this is a type of potato called the Lachiper potato, which was grown almost exclusively in the eastern shore, the Delmarva Peninsula in the United States in the 1940s and 50s. It was the best potato for making um, potato chips. It is no longer grown there because they don't do very well because of the higher ozone concentrations. So the laboratory studies suggest that the impact will become greater as the background ozone concentrations continue to increase. And basically, certain plants will be affected more than others. So this is the end of my message. Um, Paul, along the way, you were a key player in, in so many things that evolved into these kinds of studies. So thank you very much. And um, I'm done. <laughs>